Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It's Monday, April 21st, 2014. Now, tonight's top story may not sound like it's a very weighty story, especially when we compare it to other topics we've got tonight, like Chinese citizens beating the government bureaucrats, North Carolina fish houses shutting down. But it really is related in many different ways. You know, this story in the Nevada ranch between Harry Reid and the BLM and all that it encompasses touches on so many different elements. And there's so many elements of corruption and crime. They're just like an onion, layers of an onion that come apart. But look at this story to start with from the Supreme Court today. We've got Coca-Cola going before it, arguing about their pomegranate juice, their Minute Maid pomegranate blueberry juice, which actually contains only 0.3% pomegranate juice and 0.2% blueberry juice. Now, they were challenged by a legitimate maker of pomegranate juice that is 100% pomegranate juice, and they're challenging them under a 1946 law that prohibits false advertising. As they went before the Supreme Court, their lawyer said that the juice from Coke only contains an eyedropper of pomegranate juice, amounts to a teaspoon in each half gallon. Now, Coke came back and said, well, really, it's the FDA that has authority in this area. Think about this in a couple of different ways, especially as we see this applying in so many different areas. But let's apply it to the Nevada ranch situation. First of all, we see a lot of attacks against the Bundy family, against the supporters there, trying to demonize them as domestic terrorists. And they always go back to the grazing fees. Now, the grazing fees certainly are there. But without any context, without talking about everything else that's there, it's really kind of like looking at something that is 0.3% pomegranate juice. That's not really the story. That's a very small part of the story. You know, when you go to court, you're sworn in, you say that you're going to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And there's a lot of things that are left out, a lot of lies and disinformation that are inserted in, just like this juice from Coca-Cola. But I think it's also interesting to look at the fact that Coca-Cola appeals to the fact that essentially the court doesn't have jurisdiction here. This is something that should be done by the FDA. Again, this is something else that we saw in the Bundy case. When the federal courts, when the federal bureaucracies are losing, even in the Bundy case, it was a federal court that they were in, the bureaucracies like the EPA, the BLM, just stand up and say, you have no jurisdiction here. Why? Because they are agencies, bureaucracies that are operating like little fiefdoms. They write their own laws, they create their own taxes, they have their own courts, and of course they have their own militarized army to enforce their rules and regulations. Let's look at how this is working out for the Chinese. In a, Paul, in a story by Paul Joseph Watson today, he said, Chinese citizens beat government bureaucrats during a mass riot. Irate Chinese citizens savagely beat five government bureaucrats during an incident that escalated into a thousand-strong riot on Saturday. The disturbance began after members of the Chengguang Municipal Police, China's widely loathed bureaucrats who enforce government regulations against street vendors, and they harassed and beat a woman there. Another very similar situation we see happening everywhere. And, of course, street vendor vendors there just su substitute for that Substitute small businesses here, small businesses who don't pay off the protection money to the corrupt gov government officials, who don't pay off the proper politicians. They get shut down by the larger businesses who do engage in that kind of corruption. But look at this. This is five cops were killed in this particular incident, and this is what they said. They said the mass disturbance was the latest in a long line of violent incidents between members of the public and the urban management force, or the Qingguang, whose main duties are dealing with illegal street vendors. The bureaucrat's image has been marred by repeated media reports of their excessive use of force while carrying out their duties, sometimes resulting in injuries and even deaths. Don't we see that over and over again in America? We report on that almost on a daily basis here at InfoWars. We continually see governments using code violations to go in and drag people out of their homes in the middle of the night, beat a husband, throw the kids on the ground, arrest them in the middle of the night because there's a mother who no longer is even a part of the household who owed money to the Department of Education, and the Department of Education sends out their SWAT team to enforce that law. Or we see them attacking somebody who is selling raw milk or fill in the blanks. 
Over and over again, we see this. It's code violations that are driving this, code violations that are written by agencies that were never elected by us, that are unanswerable to us, that have essentially become fiefdoms. Look at how this is playing out now in North Carolina. We've got North Carolina fish houses, it says, are navigating a variety of issues. This is a story from journalnow.com about what's happening in North Carolina. These fishermen are being essentially shut down in the same way that Clive and Bundy was being shut down when they revoked his grazing rights, reducing the number of cattle that he could put on the land. Well, they're doing that here with the number of fish. They said they have a decrease in product due to state and federal regulations that affect many of the fish that are sold, like sea bass, grouper, flounder, and red drum. Just like they had a 90% reduction in cattle for Bundy, can you keep your business going if you have a 90% cutback? due to new regulations. He says we couldn't get enough seafood to keep up and going. And they point out that these regulations, the quotas vary by species and can be complex with harvest quotas, size limits, and times of the year that you can fish all being part of the equation. Again, same situation they saw in Nevada where they took it down to only 10% of what they had had before that they could graze on the land and then said you cannot graze on the land in certain times of the year, the key part times of the year. Now this is what's going on in North Carolina with the fishermen, same thing. Regulations are only one part of doing business, he said. High fuel prices can make it unprofitable for fishermen to run their boats for smaller harvests and seafood imports are competing with seafood that is caught in the United States. That's right, it's okay for the foreigners to overfish the neighboring areas, but you can't have Americans doing that. Now, we all know that this is also, Agenda 21 is also a part of this. And we see that the Southern Poverty Law Center, the people we can always count on to launch hysterical attacks, they're now launching hysterical attacks of critics of UN Agenda 21. In mid-April, the largely discredited group released a special report entitled Agenda 21, the UN Sustainability and Right-Wing Conspiracy Theory. It's not a conspiracy theory. It is a conspiracy. It is not a theory. Now, let's take the right-wing part of the right-wing conspiracy theory first. They point out that in Alabama, where SPLC is based, that they had a unanimous measure passed in the legislature, including all the Democrats voting in favor of 20, in 2012 to protect private property by banning UN Agenda 21. Now, they also say in the document that UN Agenda 21 is non-binding. But here's a quote from their own website, from UN Agenda 21's website. It says that it is a comprehensive plan of action to be taken globally, nationally, and locally by organizations of the United Nations system, governments, and major groups in every area where humans impact on the environment. But here's what they say is not sustainable. High meat intake, the use of fossil fuels, electrical appliances, home and workplace air conditioning, and suburban houses. See, they don't want to just get the ranchers off of the land in the rural areas. They want you out of the suburban areas as well. And, of course, they want to shut down cattle production, beef production. They want to shut down fish production. They want you eating something, I guess, like Soylent Green. But people aren't having any of it. There's a range war that's brewing. This is a very positive sign. Western lawmakers have gathered this last weekend in Utah to talk about the federal land takeover. More than 50 political leaders from nine states convened for the first time to talk about their joint goal, wrestling control of oil, timber, and mineral-rich lands away from the feds. Now, these are some pretty heavy hitters. You've got the Utah House Speaker, you've got the Idaho Speaker of the House, and you've got U.S. Senator Mike Lee. And the Speaker of the House from Idaho said that Idaho forests and rangeland managed by the state have suffered less damage and watershed degradation from wildfire than have lands managed by federal agencies. They said they're not interested in taking control of every acre of land. The lands that are off the table that rightly have been designated by the federal government, things like national parks and wilderness that have been created by an act of Congress. This is a discussion that is long time coming. These are lands that were territorial lands that should have been given to the states when they became states. But the federal government has maintained that they have ownership of it. And if you think that this is so they're doing it for the benefit of the public, you need to take a closer look at what's going on. They're going to shut this down to the public just as they're shutting it down to the ranchers. Now. In Japan, we also see the government there is pushing a false narrative. The former mayor of the area around Fukushima is saying that Fukushima radiation is killing our children and the government is hiding the truth. 
Now, what he pointed out was that compared with Chernobyl, radiation levels around Fukushima are four times higher. And although the government is trying to get people to come back to the area, he says it's much too early for people to come back. It's by no means safe, no matter what the government says. He says that they've launched a come home campaign. It kind of sounds like, I guess, duck and cover from the early days of the uh, nuclear test. They were telling kids. In many cases, they are forcing evacuees to return. And he says, although air contamination has decreased a little, soil contamination remains the same. And he was showing a map. This affects about 2 million people. He says they've got all sorts of medical issues. And listen to this last statement he has. And think about it in terms of fluoride, vaccines, SSRI, and of course, radiation is going to be a part of the equation here as well. He says, they believe, the people believe, what the government says, while in reality, radiation is still there. This is killing children. They die of heart conditions, asthma, leukemia, thyroiditis. Lots of kids are extremely exhausted after school. Others are simply unable to attend PE classes. But the authorities still hide the truth from us. I don't know why. Don't they have children of their own? It hurts so much to know that they can't protect our children, that they won't protect our children. And again, that is the same thing we see happening from the government, whether it's vaccines or fluoride or radiation or drugs that they require kids to take in school like Ritalin. Over and over again, they deny the negative effects. They deny the effects that it's having on children. Government is always telling us that they're doing things to protect the children, and yet they seem to have no concern whatsoever, whether it's the Japanese government or the American government, and yet people blindly believe what they tell them. Now, let's take a look at this story that's happening in Syria. Al-Qaeda in Syria gets anti-aircraft missiles. The Curtin MO reports that Time Magazine reported Monday that officials at the White House are seriously considering sending man pads, man portable air defense systems, to terrorist mercenary groups operating in Syria. Now, earlier this month, we reported that the U.S. delivered its sophisticated BGM-71 tow anti-tank weapon to moderate mercenary forces in Syria, so-called moderate forces. This harkens back to the supplying of Afghan freedom fighters, who later became al-Qaeda, in the 1980s. And of course, as Kurt Nemo points out, those Stinger missiles would eventually be used against U.S. troops. And remember that it was in Benghazi that it was a transfer of surface-to-air missiles, as well as other heavy equipment, RPGs, that was the center of what was going on there in Benghazi, as we've learned from many of our sources. And, of course, that was why Stevens was killed there. So we see the same things happening over and over again. As our government lies to us about health, as it lies to us about the legal basis for what it's doing out west, it's also lying to us about the terrorist threat, supplying the very terrorists that it says are threatening our freedom and our liberty here. Now stay tuned, right after the break, we have a special report from Jakari Jackson, a one year look back at what happened in Boston with the Boston Marathon bombing and the lies that were told to us by the government then. Stay tuned.